And welcome to the uh, Industry 4.0 Community Weekly Podcast for Tuesday, October 11th, 2022. I'm your host, Walker D. Reynolds, and we are live. I'm actually getting good at that intro, Josh. I don't know if you agree or not, but I think I'm getting getting good. Those of you guys may not know, Josh, who Josh produces the podcast, he can he can hear everything I'm saying uh, before you guys hear it. So um, welcome to the podcast this week, everybody. Uh, howdy, howdy, howdy. As you guys can tell by the title, today we are going to go over uh, unified namespace and digital transformation. Um, I'm going to touch on some things I don't generally touch on, answer some questions that don't uh, aren't normally asked uh, publicly. These are sort of answers we give privately. Um, and a uh, couple of announcements, um, which I will start with uh, here now. If there's anything you guys want me to answer right away, please uh, drop it in the chat. As a reminder, I can't see the, the live stream itself, but I do see the chats come in from both LinkedIn and YouTube. First announcement. So last week, you guys will remember in the podcast, I uh, asked a question about um, we've been throwing around this idea of alternating weeks. So podcast on a Tuesday and then the following week do a, uh, a whiteboard video. Um, but it, and you guys commented um, and the general consensus is that we do both. So we are going to do both and we're going to do it in basically two types of formats. So uh, number one is going to be the type of format we're doing this week, which is I have a podcast on a subject and then there will be an accompanying whiteboard video that we will release later in the week uh, on this subject. So we actually shot this unified namespace whiteboard video already. But two things uh, the lighting was really terrible. My eyes looked really, really black and um, we didn't use the new studio. So we're going to reshoot it. I'm actually reshooting it after, excuse me, after this podcast. So we'll, we'll release it later in the week. Um, and then the other format will be where we shoot a whiteboard video and we premiere the video uh, with the podcast. And then the remainder of the podcast will be us talking, answering questions about that whiteboard video. Okay. Um, and the reason why is because our audience is ten, is trending more technical. So if you look at how the audience has developed over the course of three or four years, um, if we were to shoot like a technical video three years ago when we first started doing our content in the very beginning, nobody would watch it. Um, we did this concept of like, we'd shoot a video like on say digital transformation and then we would do like digital transformation for the advanced and the the regular digital transformation video would get you know 10 times as many views as the technical video right and and now the way that the content is developed the way that we do all this is we um all of our technical training is done through iiot.university so with the, you know, the, the free content within IOT.university plus mastermind and the mentorship programs is where we're doing all the technical training. And so we, the idea had been the stuff that we're doing on YouTube is really centered around more generic, um, 10,000 foot view, 5,000 foot view. And then we get into the deeper stuff in those programs, but we want to provide more technical content, which is what we're going to do. So we're bringing back the whiteboard videos um, and we're going to do it in conjunction with the podcast. So this week there will be a whiteboard video that comes out later in the week that accompanies this unified namespace and digital transformation topic that we're going to cover today in the podcast. And then I'm going to answer um, YouTube comments um, at the end on, on various videos, not just YouTube, but just uh, comments in general. Um, the other thing I found out here in the last, mm, say, two weeks, I, w I wanted to make the announcement today, but I, I can't because um, the, the information is not public yet. Um, and while this isn't a publicly traded company, 
um, it's a pretty large announcement. So we, we found out in the last couple of weeks that there's a, a you know, a, an emerging automation company that is dissolving. Um, and it's, and it's really like a huge shock, uh, honestly. Um, and there are people who are watching the video who know who they are, uh, because I, I did see that there was a conversation going on in the discord server, uh, about it, about who's, who it is. Um, I, I'm, I'm shocked to hear it, but I will have more to, I was shocked when I heard it, you know, whatever, a week and a half ago or, or whatever it was, but, um, when the announcement is made, which I suspect we should probably hear here in the next week, um, I suspect their technology is going to be acquired by somebody. Um, and so I don't think they're really probably going to go anywhere in terms of what they provide the market. But I will. You'll know as soon as the announcement comes out, you'll go, holy shit. Um, and when that announcement's made, uh, you know, I'll I'll comment about it on the podcast ad nauseum. And I will have all of my very strong opinions, which and I'll tell you a couple of stories about this company once that happens. But be on the lookout over the next week, maybe two weeks for a, an announcement about a, you know, a, a, a fairly big splash maker, um, you know, in, you know, in industry with some pretty amazing um, technology uh, that's the, this company's dissolving. So uh, kind of a big deal. Um, I, I will tell you that the, the reason they're they're struggled in the market has to do with their value proposition. They're hyper focused on security um, and encryption, and that's sort of their value proposition. They expect you to pay a super super high premium for their technology, like two x at least premium for their technology. Um, and obviously, it's tough to make that argument um in the market so but anyway i'll have more more to comment on it uh let's do with presents question here um yep so uh how does digital twin how will digital twin play in digital transformation um i'm actually going to answer this question in the uns stuff but i want to i'll do it right now probably one of the number one questions we get for about the unified namespace is isn't the unified namespace just a digital twin or we'll get, isn't the unified namespace just a master data model? Okay. Um, no, it is definitely not a digital twin. Okay. Um, the important thing to note about a digital twin is that a digital twin is a digital representation <coughs> of your business and processes but it is, it is one you construct, okay? Digital twin has gaps in it. There are things that are missing, okay? From your digital infrastructure, okay? Um, number one, because the only thing that's in the digital twin is the thing you put in the digital twin. That is you, you build, you create, you configure in your digital twin, okay? Um, a unified namespace has some underlying concepts, right? So you have to use technology. It's technology driven, so it's fully open. It's not built in some, it's not a twin built in some platform, okay? It is a twin. It is a, uh, the unified namespace is a digital representation of your business that is driven by the digital things in your business. Whereas a digital twin is something you construct. It's like, it's the difference between connecting to a PLC and browsing all of the tags, the tag namespace inside of a PLC, and connecting to KEP server, okay, and browsing the tags that you configured in KEP server, okay? The only thing that's in KEP server is the thing you put in there. So unless I imported all the tags from a PLC or I created all the tags in the PLC, then if I'm looking at the KEP server namespace, okay, NS1, um, the only thing that's there is what I've configured. That's what a digital twin is. Okay, a digital twin, all the digital twin software and, you know, solutions, they're all configured and parameterized. <coughs> a unified namespace is built on common technology 
that is edge driven report by exception lightweight and open architecture those are four the four pillars right three pillars we had the open architecture at the end um the edge driven piece is is that the smart thing in the business connects to infrastructure arlen nipper likes to say this he says don't don't connect don't connect the smart things in your business to applications connect them to infrastructure and that's where the unified namespace comes from you take the smart thing and you plug it into infrastructure and the unified namespace based on the way that you plugged it into the infrastructure you told it where to publish its data um all the smart things together publishing into one infrastructure creates a unified namespace based on the way that you have uh configured it the way that you you you've semantically constructed it a digital twin is something where you start at the software that represents the twin and you configure it like you do kept tag you kept where tags right as opposed to plugging connecting to a plc and browsing all the tags that are inside of a plc the digital twin is more like the abstraction that you have created as opposed to the unified namespace being something that is created from the smart things that are plugged so at, when a thing changes in a uh, or a, a namespace changes inside of a plc for example <clears throat> you add a tag there's nothing you have to do at the at in the center to for that tag to show up it pushes okay so but where is the place for a digital twin simulation so if i if what i wanted to do was i wanted to create a simulator okay I, there it, it would be wholly appropriate to create a twin a digital twin that only encapsulates the the part of the business i want to simulate okay it's okay to do it there that's where digital twin comes in appropriately but the idea that what people refer to as digital twin is the structure and state of your business is ridiculous that's absurd right so the place for digital twin is really in simulation um however how everyone uh hey everyone this is hassan uh how can we link digital twin with plc it depends on which digital twin platform you're using so that's a much longer what we'd have to do there is um like do an actual session where we talk about digital twinning software um and then is it sai Minaj? can you compare a unified namespace for process industry versus a unified namespace for automotive industry it would be great how the data ops parts differs in context to process industry which is a pain so far um yes uh we can do that i may uh jo josh do me a favor and snap that take take a copy of that and we'll shoot up just a separate whiteboard video on that piece directly um <clears throat> luca yeah we're going to talk about the unified namespace your question there do you have any reference about the uns or did you create the term i love it all right yes i created the term um so let's talk about the unified namespace so there was a question that came from one of the large i i don't know am, um, cheryl am i allowed to share where the request came from you didn't write that question like can i say or is that private <clears throat> yes all right so um jeff winter from well yes i can share it or yes it's private <laughs> uh sorry yes yeah, share okay so jeff winter from microsoft reached out okay um you guys may know jeff jeff winter from linkedin jeff and i have collaborated on a couple of uh um uh panels before and you know, like behind the scenes we talk together quite a bit love the content that jeff does you know jeff is you know he, i think he's a former former grand tech guy uh marketing and business development but also he's an engineer right and i think he went to purdue. he's an engineer from purdue if i correct it, it, sorry jeff if you're not a purdue guy forgive me um but jeff asked this sent this question because microsoft's been working on some uns stuff right and he said, how does the UNS relate to or differ from what people are writing about digital core? OK, common data model. Aren't these the same thing? UNS is just another term for master data model. Right. OK, 
So the answer to that is, and, and there are a couple of other questions that um, people ask about um, unified namespace, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so I shot this whiteboard video to answer these questions. <clears throat> the answer is, no, the unified namespace is not another term for a master data model, okay? Uh, it is, it can be a physical, it can be a tree-based representation of a master data model, but it is not a master data model. Here's what the unified um, namespace is. And in fact, uh, I have a, a photo I want to make sure I include <clears throat> while I'm doing this. So uh, the unified namespace, in a nutshell, the best way to describe it, it is, it is the structure and the events of a business, okay? So it is it is the single source of truth for all data and information in an organization, okay? So when we, when you talk about what is the unified namespace, okay? It's important to understand where it came from. Like early on in my career, okay? One of the things that I discovered while I was looking at, when I was doing projects, for the employers that I worked for, the end users. So when I worked in the mining industry, when I worked in steel, when I worked in printing, when I worked in tier one automotive, one of the things that always stood out to me was how unbelievably inefficient our project process was and how unrelated each engineering project was to one another. Like there was no common infrastructure or strategy for how we would solve problems in our plants. It would be like, I had a problem to solve and I would go and I would s come up with some, I'd spec an idea, spec a solution. I'd have a problem statement. I'd spec a solution. Then I'd just go to like all these vendors and say, I'm kind of thinking about doing this thing. And all the vendors would give me recommend software and hardware, um, field wiring, um, engineering services that could solve that specific problem and that specific problem only and it never took into account what I already had in place or what I might do later. It was always just that one thing. And I kept saying, well, fuck, that's so unbelievably inefficient. Like, why do I have data over here and now I have data over there and I've got data over there and I got data over there and I got seven or eight different vendors and, you know, and they don't talk to one another. And so if, if I've got data over here that I need to use over here, I can't retrieve it without spending a ton of engineering money in between the two. So the concept of the unified namespace was really about making it so that I could learn faster and get my projects done quicker. Like I, one of the things that frustrated me is that it would take me because I was, I was always starting from scratch on every solution. Yeah, I would, I would spend a year, you know, in a year I would do maybe three major projects, but I would be like, well, why can't I just do, like a major project every six weeks, like, and I could, if I was, if I was building, if I was solving problems on one common infrastructure, I could do that. So the unified namespace came from this idea that what I would do is just create one infrastructure. So, and that was back when we had data highway plus, okay, this is my career started in the late nineties. So I had DH plus, And the first thing I had to do was gateway DH plus to OPC. Right. So whether I was doing that through Capware or, or um, you know, RS links or how, however I was doing that, the first thing I had to do was I had to convert field protocols into a protocol I could use for common infrastructure. The first unified namespace was built on OPC UA. And the reason that I, or OPC DA really first, and then sort of switched to UA, uh, it, it, M MQTT became the protocol of choice once I realized that pub sub was never really going to happen in OPC and that OPC was too verbose and, you know, all the stuff that I talk about in terms of like, Hey, you can't scale with OPC DA or UA in the middle of your industrial infrastructure is because I've got the scars to prove it. I, I tried it many times. So the unified namespace came from this concept that in order, in order for us to have short time to value, that is, be able to solve many, many problems, more problems in a year than we had been, and make it so that we could, the all the data that we 
collected and the information we created from solving problems was going to be in one place, I had to create something like the unified namespace. Because what was obvious was that the vendors never considered it. The vendors were like, like Rockwell was always like, well, we only need a Rockwell store. And then, oh, we've got a Rockwell piece of software for that. Or we got a Rockwell hardware that'll be able to do that. Well, most of the shit you guys have is garbage. Like, I don't want to use yours. I want to use, like, I don't want to use that. You're historian. I want to use um, Wonderware. Or I don't want to use Factory Talk View or Panel View. I want to use InTouch. You know, the... So that's where the unified name space came from, the concept. It it grew over time. It really, unified namespace as you know it today, as what I talk about today, was created in 2012. And it was so that we could build, basically make it possible to build the largest standalone supervisory control and data acquisition system in the world that ran on one server. Okay. And that was the one that we won our big firebrand award for. Like that this is, so I was the lead engineer on this project. That had 19 developers. And in, in 18 months, we integrated across five states. This is all serial networks. Okay. So this is all serial, cellular, VSAT across five states, uh, 14,000 locations, 40,000 devices, PLCs, pump off controllers, uh, tank measurement devices, you name it. Um, 11 million tags, 2 million daily alarms. 2000 concurrent users. Okay. We had to be able to move assets from this location to that location or to, to this business unit, to that business unit. We had to be able to uh, take assets offline, put them back online. We had to be able to group assets so that we could start them up in a, in a sequential order as a function of location and electrical load and value. I mean, all these things that we had to solve. We did the whole thing in 18 months. 19 developers for $1.6 million. The next closest bid was like 25 million. Okay. And the bid above that was 50 million. The unified namespace made that possible. Okay. So that's where the unified namespace came from. It solved so, I mean, it, it started, it came from how I solved problems in the early 2000s for my employers so that I could learn faster than all the other engineers. I could, if I was doing a project every six weeks and they were taking 12 weeks or they were taking 24 weeks or they were in, and the other engineers were doing one or two a year. Elon Musk talks about this. If you compare a person who works 40 hours a week to someone who works hundred hours a week, you learn the person who learns works hundred hours a week is doing 2.5 amount of hours uh, than the other one. And so they're going to learn a lot faster. It's the same concept. Okay. The unified namespace then once we did that and we sort of became famous for it, you know, and I'm giving my, I'm doing my acceptance speech, which I think you can still watch and I'm up there holding the award and I'm, um, and Zach was there and, and all, you know, a bunch of other guys and I'm giving shout outs to all these different companies, by the way, three different companies that worked on it. And I'm giving shout outs to individual people. All of that was built on the concept of the unified namespace and was not possible without the concept of the unified namespace. All these companies started reaching out to us and they wanted the same thing. So then we started refining what the UNS was. And so here's what it is. It is the single source of truth for all data and information in an organization. So, <clears throat> you know, you call, it's not the system of own ownership, okay? You can have many systems of ownerships for any different types of data plugged into a UNS, but it is the single source of truth. So if I want to know what the value of some parameter in my business is in context, so that parameter in a semantic context so that I can understand that this value is related to this asset in this way relative to these other parameters of these values, that's what the single source of truth is. Okay, it's the structure in the events. So it's based on ISA 95. Generally, we structure organizations the way their ERP systems structure them. So if you were to go in and look at a master data model of SAP, okay, uh, hey, 
Zach can probably find it. Hey, Zach, um, I know you're on here. Tesla details guy. Do you want to try and find the the Firebrand Award, please? That project. I, I know that you, you're you the one who had the, the video clip from the acceptance speech that we shot, put in a couple of the videos. If you know how to grab that, please find it. Um, structure and events. Uh, by the way, I, we won that award when I worked for a different company. It's before I created my integrator, so I can't talk about it in too much detail. I can't, I can't talk about it as if it's an Intellic thing because an Intellic didn't do it. I just, I was the lead engineer on it <clears throat> for this other company and I'm the one who accepted the award. And uh, It's the structure and the events of your business. More importantly, this is how it differs from say digital twin or digital core. It is the hub through which all the smart things talk. Okay. Now that doesn't mean 100% of the things in your business talk through a unified namespace, but more than 80% do. You still have point to point integrations. You may have, <clears throat> say, a PLC that talks directly to some other piece of software, but not through a UNS. But any information or data they exchange, they put in the UNS. One or both of them does. Okay. Um, and then it's the foundation of your digital future. So the things that you visualize in your organization, like what do, what do we actually, you know, what is digital transformation, right? It's con connect to the data collect it, store it, analyze it, visualize it. Analyzing a lot of times is conversion of data into information. So if I take a data point that I'm storing every one second and I want to visualize it over 60 seconds, I'm not looking at data. I'm looking at information because just the, the by virtue of plotting it on a chart, putting 60 of those data points on one chart, that's now information. Okay. So we connect, collect, store, analyze, and visualize. All the things that you visualize in a digital organization, the vast majority of the things you visualize, they are visual representations of the structure and events that are in the unified namespace. Uh, Platts, Hirsch. So what about big chunks of data like images or video? Is this point to point? Can be, but one of the very first things we ever tested. So I'll tell you a little image thing. <clears throat> one of the very first things we ever tested in 2000, I think this was 2015 when Arlen Nipper gave his big MQTT presentation and inductive automation and sort of turned the, ind the industrial world on its ear. He flew out to Dallas after ICC. I, so he he talks about when he gave his, his first presentation, there was this guy who stood up, you know, nobody really said anything. This guy stands up and he says, hey, if you know that, what just happened, he turns back to everybody and says, what happened on that screen? just changed industry as we know it. That guy was me. When he talks about that presentation, he says there's this guy that stood up and pointed at the screen. He's talking about me. I'm the one who did that. And I literally pointed to everybody in the room and it was packed. And I literally said, that changes everything. Right after <clears throat> that presentation, <coughs> Arlen and Wes flew out to Dallas and met with our team. And one of the things I first asked Arlen was, Arlen, if I want to use MQTT, Sparkplug B didn't exist yet. If I want to use MQTT as the protocol um, for my digital infrastructure, for a unified namespace, and I explained to him what a UNS is and how we build projects and solve problems, I said, am I, true, am I really not limited in what my payload could be in an MQTT topic? Like, could I send images? could I send video stream? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, let's prove it. I said, if you prove that, I will, I'll, we'll use MQTT. And so what we did was we did a test in East Texas for an oil and gas customer who had three cameras over a cellular network on their well pad. And the way it was really set up was you would have to like remote in through a web server um, you'd have to, you'd have to remote in through a web server and you would, um, then view still images of what the well pad looked like. What we said to, uh, Arlen and Wes is we want to be able to send one frame per second. So send a frame per second over MQTT and Wes said, no problem. And they went back. I think they were in Kansas city or something. 
They went back to Kansas City. He came back the next week, and he uh, he um, he proved that it, it worked over a 256k second, uh, 256k per second connection. We sent one frame, one frame per second, okay, or one video frame per second as a payload. So to answer your question, yes, you can send images and video over um, MQTT to a unified namespace, okay? Um, but you can also do it point to point, okay? You can do it both. And this is where the architect comes in, okay? Um, Andrew DeJuan, he says, is this master hub an MQTT broker? All right. That actually reminds me of something. <laughs> so I want to bring up a point here. Um it can be an MQTT broker. What I'll say is this, is it has to be a broker. It ha you know, PubSub is the architecture you have to use. If you're going to be edge-driven, report by exception, lightweight, and open architecture, you got to use PubSub, okay? But it doesn't have to be an MQTT broker, okay? But I want to, you use the term master. So I wanted to, I, I wasn't going to talk about this. I want to talk about it real quick. I got a ton of messages. Will Healy, who is a, uh, Actually, I don't know what Will does. Great guy, love him to death. He was on a, a panel that I was on. Will published a video on LinkedIn the other day about inclusive language in industry and in IT and how we have to get away from using terms like master slave and um, I can't remember what the other ones were that he was using, but master slave is the one he really focused on. And I got <clears throat> tons and tons and tons of messages. <laughs> Hey, Walker, you should really comment on this, right? And, you know, what are your feelings? Like, is this something we really need to be uh, worried about or whatever? And there were some things in there, you know, like he said, you know, language matters, word matters, words matter. We need our language needs to be more inclusive. Um, let me say this. I I subscribe. I, I understand where Will's coming from. And I don't, you know, I think that we should try and use as inclusive language is humanly possible, but I don't think it needs to be our top priority. I think it, I think we make, we make it a much bigger deal than it really needs to be. Okay. Um, you know, we have bigger problems. <laughs> uh, I, I know that if we were to suddenly tomorrow start, you know, we just abandoned the, the concept of the term master slave in it. And we tried to use one of the more inclusive terms, uh, we would create massive amounts of inefficiency and lots of mistakes. And right now we can't really afford that. It's just not that important. Um, if I'm being honest with you. Um, but that being said, I think inclusive language is important and I think it, it's a, it's an admirable goal and it's something we should work on over time, but it shouldn't be our top priority. Um, if I'm being honest with you, I just think there are bigger fish to fry. Uh, moreover, I don't think the words we use are really all that important. At the end of the day, like I think if you say something that offends someone else, um, if you what you were going to do is try and go through your entire life and never say anything offensive, you'd never achieve anything. I mean, you'd spend all your time, you know, worrying about how everyone might react to something rather than getting facts out there. Right. So for me, it's just not something I pay a whole lot of attention to. I try to I try to not offend and I try to be as inclusive as I can, but it's not something I think we ought to overly be that worried about. Um, Joshua Stover quoting Jordan Peterson in order to think you must risk being offensive. Um, all right. It last thing, the UNS is the foundation of your digital infrastructure. Okay. So is, is the unified namespace a master data model? No, it is not. Okay. Um, it is, it is the master data model um, is a structure, but it but a master data model doesn't have any events. One of the things that we tried to do with the unified namespace is combine the master data model of an organization, that is the structure of an organization, with the historian of an organization, um, with the actual raw events through an OPC server of an organization in one place. So I could see the structure, I could see the current value, and if I watched over time, I could see the history. 
and I could compare, I, I would automatically normalize every single data point. So at any given time, I could, if I wanted to see OEE relative to, uh, relative to some type of temperature or account, I could do that because the OEE wouldn't change. Every time the temperature changed, I just grab both. Boom, 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 boom. But if I go and do that from, say, a historian, <clears throat> that's a little, that's a lot more challenging. Okay. Um, because the historian doesn't store at all the same intervals. Okay. Um, so what we tried to do is combine the three together. Right. Uh, there was another question that someone asked as it related to the unified namespace, and I can't remember what it was. Um, uh, Matt Paris said, Uni the unified namespace has a communication component. Yes, all the smart things are connected together and an information component. Uh, master data it has a communication component and information component. It also has a data component. I want to delineate the difference between data and information. Data is not actionable. Information is. Data is just a data point. Something that happened and when it happened, information is something you can act on. Sometimes a raw data point, if you have more than one value, so I have the last three values of a specific data point, that becomes information because I, I might be able to act on that. It could show me a trend, right? <clears throat> but he says, UNS has a communication component and information component. Master data model can be the basis for defining the information model that should be implemented by the actual devices. Exactly. Every organization has a master data model for that business. Like every organization has that. Okay. But they don't have it in one place. They try to put it in the ERP system. Okay. The problem is if you were to go, let's say you were to go in and you were to do like a, a select star join on the full master data model of an organization in an ERP SQL backend. So a select star join so that I had all the entities extended and their relationship, and I selected all of them. You would, you would, that master data model would never be what if you were to turn it into a tree structure. Okay. So if you were to put that in a tree structure, it would not be an accurate representation of your digital infrastructure. What we tried to do was jump that hurdle by taking the digital infrastructure, telling it what it what what place in the semantic hierarchy it reports to, and have everything report. And then by using a broker, we can visualize what it actually looks like out there. Not only that, not just the structure of what it looks like out there, but what all the current values are right now. And then we could take smart software, we could take software, plug into that. We could consume from what it really looks like out there, what the real values are, we could post process, we could create more information and we could put it back into the, we could add to it. And then you could put consumers, plug consumers into it, who could then consume uh, the, the, all the information, not just the stuff that's in the ERP or not just the stuff that's in the PLC. Okay. Um, Liam Doyle, what about using data from the edge? to create a unified namespace and then from the unified namespace data, create a digital twin of whatever object you wish to model. For example, a production machine, a production line. That's exactly how we do it, Liam. It's literally, we create, we make the digital twin, a subscriber of the unified namespace of only the part of the namespace that you want to simulate. Um, last out loud, master slave, I support RTU civil rights. Let me say, Will Healy's point is well taken. Let me just say that. I, I respect that Will um, published that, that did put that post on LinkedIn. And what I'm doing is answering the questions that came to me. Walker, what's your opinion on this? I wouldn't have commented on it if people didn't ask me. Um, yes, Alan Ramsey speaks volumes regarding the two types of namespaces, definitional and functional. Definitional is the master data model space. Functional is the is the, the function of the business. All right, let's get to YouTube comments here. All right, so um, I'm gonna be shooting, a, on the unified namespace, I'm gonna be shooting a whiteboard video that is what is the unified namespace and I'm gonna be answering the specific questions that our business development people come to, come, come to me with. They say, oh, clients ask this question about it, okay? 
how would you answer this walker and i i really i already shot this video and we might what we might do is take the video and share it with the community like the mastermind and mentorship people if they want to see it because i'm pretty i'm pretty fired up in that video um but the lighting is terrible it looks you know it doesn't look that good but i might share it we might share it on for mastermind and mentorship so you guys can see like my raw take on the video we won't even edit it you guys can just see me <laughs> shooting the video and see if you think it's funny or not all right we did a video on quiet quitting so this is probably the place where most people would quit the podcast please don't this is an important conversation if you've stuck it out for these 40 minutes stick with us because i'm gonna i'm gonna cover um answer some questions on digital transformation um at a legacy company and but i want to go over this quiet quitting thing so you guys may have seen we put a short up that was a quiet quitting short and um and we got a lot of like pushback okay and so i'm just going to read the comments that came in on it and then i'm going to comment on them and why this is important and the reason for all you guys out there if you're a business owner you work in an organization this is going to get worse you're going to see a lot more of this um i'm going to tell you what the implications are for quiet quitting and specifically the implications on our industry okay not what happens when people are quiet quitting in our industry, but what does it mean like for manufacturing and stuff? Okay. So Cherubin seventh said, uh, this, these people who are quiet quitting, they're just trying to handle their abuse from employers. Okay. Uh, Hilkmeister said, yeah, it shows that you don't have a good work, work ethic, but employers have no qualms about fucking you over. So you have to look out for your own best interests. If that means using new skills, training, or certs to get a better job elsewhere, then that's just the labor market. Quiet quitting is also an example of the labor market at work. Employers get what they pay for. Uh, we don't live in a time where an employer is going to give you a good raise or bonus for working your ass off, so it's better to just give them what they pay for. This is just free enterprise capitalism at work. There's no morality in it. No, it says a lot about who you are as an individual, just like I, I give a hard time to organizations who treat people like a number. Okay. I'm saying by, if you're working for an organization who treats you like a number, don't work there anymore. Okay. But I'm going to tell you why quiet quitting is bad, terribly bad. And, and, and it's not working the way you're talking about. Okay. Uh, Mayo Yoma, it's all business, baby. Nothing personal. Same thing. Employers say to people, they are letting go despite all the hard work and risk the employee took to stay loyal. How about paying people more if you want to get more production out of them? Actually, paying people more doesn't get you more production. It actually gets you less. Paying people more gets you entitlement. If you pay people more and they don't earn it, you just give it to them, what you get is entitlement. I know that because I own 49 companies and I have lots of employees. Okay, um, What you do is you make what you pay people public. That's the solution. The solution is in our organization, we're fully transparent. Every person in this organization knows exactly how much everyone else makes. And if I overpaid myself, I'd have people coming to me, giving me a hard time about it. Also, it, it keeps management honest, okay? It keeps management. What you ought to do when you're interviewing for a position is ask your, your potential employer, it, you know, uh, do you guys publish salaries? Is that some, is that information you share? We do. It's what I do. Okay. Um, and then Dirk gently, <laughs> these people who do the troll accounts, they crack me up. He said, laugh my fucking ass about it or cry about it. If the employer can't keep an employee, that means they aren't paying a reasonable wage for the skills the employee now has. When another company is, that's the employer's fault, not the employees. Quiet quitting isn't about you leaving. It's about you doing less. Okay. And quiet quitting is just called doing your job. The only people who need to act like it's is being a bad person are bosses who don't care about their employees. Sound like that's you. Well, Dirk gently, I challenge you to find anyone who works here who would say I'm not a good boss or that I'm not a good leader or that I don't pay my team fairly. I challenge you to do that. 
because you're not going to find anyone. You're not going to find anyone here who says, I don't genuinely care about them and their families. You're not going to find anyone here who says that I don't, uh, I don't pay people, um, more than they're worth exactly or more. Uh, when we, when the, when inflation hit last year, and I think, you know, now inflation's at 8% or whatever, but last year I think it was at, it was four and some change a year ago. I was the one who went to the board and said, we need to give cost of living raises across the board of 5% or whatever it was that we gave. Um, and, and they said, why are, is anyone complaining? And I said, no, that's our job. It's our job to keep an eye on the market. And, you know, these guys can't make, you know, these guys and gals can't make less money than they made last year. And then we're like, well, what do we do? Well, you pass that on. That's the way the business works. You pass it on to your next, you know, your next, uh, you know, we increase our rates by 5%. That's what we do. Okay. But what we're not going to do is put it on our employees. So I challenge you, Dirk, gently to find someone who thinks that I don't care about my employees. Someone who works here. You're not going to find one because I do genuinely, honestly care. Okay. So you're a douchebag. <laughs> I and I can prove it because you proved it in that comment you said right there. Here's why quiet quitting is bad. I I challenge all of you to go look at your job descriptions. Okay. Your job descriptions are going to include uh, a title and they're going to include a list of things. Okay. And then the, you're going to then they're going to include a couple of clauses in there about uh, part of your job is to uphold the values and the mission, you know, and to look out for the best interest of the organization. Okay. There will also be one in there about, and you have any, you're, you promise to do any jobs that your supervisor also comes up with. And the reason those clauses are in your job description is because um, the, the, the reason those job descriptions are in your, those clauses are in your job descriptions is because business changes. And the first thing you do as a leader is, and this happens here when we see the market shifting, what we'll do, and we just had this the other day, we're changing one of our products and we called in a bunch of people, engineers and everyone and said, we're thinking about doing this in the market and we're going to need somebody to do this task and we're going to need someone to do that task and we're going to need someone to do that task. Who's going to take that on? Who's going to, who wants to do this thing? And who wants to do this part? And who wants to do this part? Now, if if everyone in the organization said, I'm only going to do the thing that I that you told me yesterday I was going to do, then you would never do anything new until you hired someone else. And that means your organization wouldn't innovate. Moreover, companies that survive over the long term, they get more efficient over time. Quiet quitting is about decreasing productivity. And guess what will happen when you decrease productivity? Okay. Companies will figure out a way to make that spot, the amount of money that they're spending in that spot, more productive. What you're doing is you're, you're not, you're not holding up your end of the bargain because what you're doing is art is ignoring those last two clauses that are in your job description that you're going to do what's in the best interest of the company. Okay. And you're going to do you're going to do any other things that your boss asks you to do. Why did they don't put those clauses in there to treat you like crap? Are there companies out there that treat you like crap? Yes. Don't work for them. Quit. That's the market working. But it is not the market working if you enter into a social contract with an employer, okay? Not a legal contract. If you're an at-will employee, if you basically say I'm going to do what's in this job description, okay? Yeah, I still care for Zach and he doesn't even work here. So fuck off Dirk Gently. Okay. <laughs> the um the what you're doing is you are punishing your employer and not holding up your end of the bargain. Okay. Someone had made the comment that um I I I said I said that something my dad told me this and I, I made, the, I made this comment and somebody commented to me about it. My father told me when I was a kid, my brothers and sisters, he said, you better always know how much you cost and how much revenue you generate. 
So you better know exactly what you cost and you better know exactly how much revenue you generate. And if you're not generating three times what you cost, then you're on the chopping block. Now, in really, really large organizations, okay, in really, really large organizations, it doesn't have to be 3x, okay? Because there are both fixed cost and variable cost models in businesses. Really large organizations are variable cost. So costs go down per employee, the more employees you have. Fixed costs, that's a little different, okay? You better know how much money you generate and exactly how much you cost. You are not entitled to anything but opportunity. And if you are one of these people who is promoting quiet quitting, um, you're part of the problem in our economy. Because your employer is still holding up their end of the bargain. I mean, I say this all the time. How many times have you gone to cash your paycheck and it wasn't there? Like how many times have you gone to cash your paycheck and the and it wasn't there? Okay, quiet quitting is incredibly dangerous and it is immoral. And anyone who thinks that this is an effective way of making employers better is a fucking moron. An absolute moron. Okay. I haven't, we haven't had anyone quiet quit here. Okay. I, I only brought it up because this is becoming an epidemic. How, what's the impact on the industry? More automation. I mean, that's a simple reality. More automation. You think quiet quitting is going to make employers treat you better. Okay. I'll tell you this. I've been a rock star my whole career. Okay. My whole career, I've been a top 1% guy. I've, I've always been way more productive than everyone else around me. And I did get treated differently. I, I came up in a meritocracy. Okay. Did I always get, was I always happy with the way my employer treated me? No. But did I trust their judgment? Yes. The moment I didn't trust the judgment of my, my employer, I left. The moment I the moment I didn't trust the judgment, I was out. This is why you need to save your money. You need to have one year salary in your savings account. If you're watching this video and you don't have one year salary saved up, that needs to be your number one priority. The moment you do that, you'll have real freedom. You won't need to quiet quit. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I got lambasted over the quiet quitting thing, but there, there, you can't come on here and make the argument that it it's, it's moral or it's good any more than I can make the argument that it's moral, that employer employers are, uh, um, yes, it, it, when when a when an employer is is not a good employer, okay, uh, or a manager doesn't have a pure heart, isn't really a leader. Um, I'm just as critical on them. Okay, um, Spencer Tibbetts. Since the pandemic, I believe people have put more effort into appreciating their own values. And when they are violated, sad thing is people have poor values. Uh, agreed, Spencer. Yeah, I, I, I shot a video. I shot a video uh, about you should never. Truben, thank you, man. That stand up on you. Um, There's no reason why you shouldn't be working for a company that shares your values. I I I was uh, I had a meeting. I, I'll, I'll say this last thing. Over uh, over the weekend, I had a bunch of people at my house for the the OU um, UT game. So we went to the Red River Showdown 
on Saturday. We do it every year. It's a big, you know, it's a big production. If you guys haven't been to Red River Showdown, which is at the Cotton Bowl at the Texas State Fair or the State Fair of Texas, um, we do it every year. It's amazing event. This year I went with a bunch of OU people. So I think there was nine of us that went. Three of us were UT fans. Six of them were OU fans. So I got us the tickets in the OU side of the 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 um, stadium. And uh, two of the people that came with us are in the military. Okay, one of them is in. Um, they're both in security forces. And um, I was having a conversation. It was a husband and wife. And I, I was having a later on that night. I think it was that night. It may have been the next day. Uh, you know, by the way, UT blew out OU 49, nothing. I actually said it was going to be 42 to seven UT. So go me. I got the points, right? Um, I was talking to this girl and we were talking about the military and I was talking about how, you know, most of the people I know who went in the military, when they get, when they get out after six years or 10 years or something, when they're tw one, what would have been their 20th anniversary comes up. They always wish they had stayed for the 20. We were having this conversation. And she was talking about, well, I don't want to stay in because I, you know, I've got poor leadership right now and, you know, we're just a number and they don't care about us and, you know, all those things. And I said to her, um, well, what do you value? Like, what do you, what matters to you? Right. Um, and, you know, she, and she's young, I think maybe 25 or something. And she's, she's been in five years and, um, she really didn't have, I mean, most 25 year olds don't have a really good answer for that. So I, I don't want to be unfair to her there. She was very, you know, she knew what she wanted out of life, but she didn't know, she couldn't really articulate what she valued um, or uh, what her mission was. But I said to her, I said, you know, I'm going to give you a piece of advice here. Okay. That'll change your career. Okay. Um, when you get out and you start, when she told me how much money she made and you know, I, I, I don't, you know, we work really long hours and I don't really feel like I get, I get paid, you know, enough. And, you know, she's giving me the numbers and her husband's giving me his numbers and I'm putting the numbers together. And I'm like, wow, you guys don't really know what the world world real world is like, because you make more than the average. You don't have any kids. You don't have a mortgage. And the two of you combined make more than the, you know, the, the average um, U.S. family does way more, almost double. So you're getting paid a lot better than you think you are. This is this is a spending issue. This is not. So we're going through, you know. But she was talking about the leadership thing. And I said, you know what? Get over it. You're going to work for bad people. You're going to work for good people. The most valuable person in the market is the one who can work with both. I mean, employer, if what you want to do is you want to move up the food chain, you want to, and you want to have a job of purpose and you're not just doing labor and you want to, you want to, end up on the board one day or be someone in a position of leadership, then you need to be a person who's really bought in on the values and the mission of an organization and not focused on the way your boss talks to you. That doesn't mean that she's talked about toxic leadership and all this stuff. And I'm like, what is toxic? I still don't know what toxic means. Like I'm a smart guy. I still have no idea what toxic means. It sounds to me like you're the one who's taking things as toxic because there are, you know, sometimes you deserve to get yelled at. I mean, are you really suggesting that you're entitled to never be offended or ever have your feelings hurt like your whole life? You're really suggesting that that's absurd. The, the you know why our economy exists the way it does is because the alternative is we'd all be farming and being on the verge of starvation. And we'd live in shitty houses because none of us can be really good at all the things that you need to do in order to live a life if you don't live in a civilized um, community where we're trading labor. There's no promise that you're never gonna be offended or never disappointed or never sad. So what I told her is this, I said, I'm gonna give you a piece of advice here. Every time you feel bad about something, every time, let's say you screw up at your job and your boss gives you a hard time, embrace it. There's a book by Ryan Halliday called Embrace the Obstacle or Obstacle is the Way. Zach just read it, actually. Zach did a like a live reading. We gave the books out to everybody. 
Failure is the point. You should be you should be happy every time you fail because it's the only time you learn. So when your boss yells at you or your boss says, "Hey, no, you did it. You did it this way. You did it wrong. Let's do it this way." Or, "Hey, you're four minutes late to this meeting." That if you can't if you can't get to the meeting on time, what makes you think you're going to be able to deliver your projects on time? Whatever it is, embrace that. Be be happy with it. Learn from it. And when it comes to and I said to this girl, when you go out and you interview for positions in the real world. I said, here's the answer I want to give to you. I want you to give. I want you to figure out a way to give this answer in every job interview. Okay. It'll change your life. When they ask you, what did you learn in the military in securities forces that's going to translate to you working here in real estate or in insurance or what non-security forces jobs? Your answer needs to be this. I worked really long hours. I worked 14 hours a day, five days a week. And I was on call where I couldn't be um, more than an hour away from the base at any given time. And then that was changed to, I couldn't, or it started out, I couldn't be more than three hours away. And then it got changed by management to, I couldn't be more than one hour away. And that made, that had a huge negative impact in my life, but it's what I signed up for. And so I did it with a smile on my face. I worked for great leaders and I worked for terrible leaders, but I flourished under both. I am resilient. I am, um, I'm dependable. Um, and I am agile. What I learned in the military is that structure in an unstructured world is a good thing. And I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for the good, the bad, and the ugly. I don't care what fucking job you are interviewing for. You give that answer. You give that answer. Everyone's going to hire you. You come here and you give that answer here at Intellic. And I don't care if your experience is all I did was mow lawns when I was a teenager. I'm hiring you. I'm hiring you and I'm putting you in a position in my company and I'll develop you myself. Okay. I get so many questions about, um, what can I do for my career? Do you have any advice for me and my career? And I read these messages and it's all me, 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 me. How can I get this? How can I get that? How can I get this? The answer is you will get out of the world what you put into it. So you should be asking the question, what can I do for them? What can I do for this organization? What can I do for this teammate? What can I do for this colleague? What can I do for this client? You have to go in trusting that our society is built on the concept that what I get out of it is a representation of what I put into it. And you want to know why so many people are unhappy with their outcomes? They're so they're unhappy with the things that they get. They're unhappy with their pay. They're unhappy with their benefits. It's because they're putting less in. Do you know what made us, you know what made us more, what has made us more efficient over the, uh, um, the last 50 years? If you look at our economy, the amount of GDP we generate per person has gone up, not down. Do you know how we did that? Is that better people? Is that better mindsets? Are people working harder? No. Automation. Automation created that efficiency. And if what you want to do is flourish in a, in a world where automation is going to become the rule and not the exception, where the digital supply chain is a, is, is a real thing, uh, a world where 50% of the people who work in our, live in our society won't be employable just 15 years from now, okay? You be the person who puts more in than everyone else. Just that simple. And that's why quiet quitting is a horrible fucking idea. All right. Um, Spencer Tibbetts. When I worked for patent attorneys, I learned how to talk to different personalities. Some were toxic. It was the best skill I've ever developed. I don't know how to teach it, though. You teach it through perspective. You, you, what you do is you, Spencer, you 
you teach it through teaching people how to change their perspective. So if you, and, and, you know, the best authors that people can read, um, you know, Jordan Peterson's 10 rules for life. I know that he's not a, he's a controversial figure. His book is, you know, I, I'm not advocating for his politics. What I'm advocating for is the book he wrote, the 10 rules for life. Everyone should read it. Everyone should read all of Ryan Holiday's stoic books on, you know, the, um, you know, the obstacle is the way. Okay. Understanding that just through a, a slight change in perspective, you can, or the 12 rules for life. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, just through a slight change in perspective can make all the difference in the world. And it, I'll give you one last example. One last example. Um, everybody knows my mom got murdered when I was seven years old. Okay. And my brother and I are the ones who found her body. Right. So when my mom got seven, when I was seven, my mom got murdered by my stepdad. He shot her in the head twice. And then he left me and my brother were at a babysitter and we came home the next morning and she was on a couch and she had a sheet over her and we were in the room with her for like 45 minutes before we ever tried to wake her up. And I walked over and I pulled the sheet back and like her eyes were all cloudy and she had blood coming out of her nose and mouth. It was all dried. She was clearly dead. She was like blue. If I had touched her, she would have been cold. I didn't. Um, my brother and I bolted. Right. And by the end of that day, we were adopted by his his dad, right? By the time I was, um, you know, later on in life, when people hear that story, they're just like, how the fuck are you not jacked up? Like, how are you even functioning? Okay? How are you even functioning? And the answer is this. It's perspective. By the time I was 12, I realized I needed to forgive anyone. I needed to forgive him. I was going to need to forgive anyone who ever wronged me. Okay? Now, there were mentors and, and, and my pastor and stuff helped me through that process. But by the time I was 12, I forgive I forgave my stepfather. I said, if he ever asked me for per forgiveness, I would give it to him. And so then I was freed of that. I didn't hold on to that anymore. So this bad boss or whatever, I would say the same thing. Don't, don't hold animosity towards a, a boss who's toxic to you. Be thankful they're toxic because you're learning a new skill. Okay. So number one, I would give forgiveness. Number two, I had to figure out how my mom getting murdered when I was seven could become a strength. Okay. And so what would it be? What would that actually be? Okay. Well, there are a lot of downsides to going through that, obviously, but there was one major upside and it was the one I decided to shift my perspective to and focus on. And that is I knew going through the rest of my life, I had gone through the worst thing I was ever going to go through when I was seven. So every challenge I was ever going to face the rest of my life was going to pale in comparison. I already knew since I survived my mom dying and I was a good student in high school, I wasn't a troublemaker. I didn't get into drugs and alcohol. I was a good athlete. I had lots of friends. Um, I was functioning. Most people were surprised when they met me. Like the fact that I survived that Man, I could overcome anything. Moreover, it put a lot of perspective on the importance of the here and now. Like, don't never waste an opportunity to learn something or achieve something. Right? In the 10 seconds, if my mom knew she was dying the 10 seconds before she died, she would have wished she had done more. That she would have wished that she skipped that night out with friends and spent it in the living room talking to her kids because that that four hours or whatever that she was out is four hours that she didn't get teaching lessons to her children and she would have been thinking in her head oh my god what i would give for that four hours right now if we could hit pause right now for that for that four hours but it was the perspective that this is a a superpower for me you know i say to zach all the time you know Zach, you have a superpower. You know, Zach, uh, Zach has, uh, I, we've talked about this before. Zach has Asperger's, right? So he, he doesn't, he doesn't, um, pick up on social cues. Well, I said, well, Zach, that's a fucking superpower, dude. That's not a downside. Here's why you will suggest things. No one else would suggest because you're not worried about how people might react to the suggestion. 
So an idea that pops in your head that other people would self-limit, you don't. It's a fucking superpower, dude. And that perspective change makes all the difference in the world. You want to be happier in life? Find the silver lining in everything. Even the worst tragedy you've ever gone through in your entire life. So yes, quiet quitting is garbage. It's bullshit. It's people who have the wrong perspective. Don't be like those people. Today on my Twitter, I posted, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I want you to go home tonight and I want you to ask yourself at work, who are the four colleagues I, or the five people I spend the most time with at work? And are they the five people I should spend the most time with? Because I'm going to be the average of those five. Same thing in your personal life. Hell, that'll change your life. All right. Off my soapbox. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, we will, I'll answer a couple other things from the, from the questions next week. Keep your guys eye out for the whiteboard video on the unified namespace later in the week. Okay. Truly appreciate you guys sitting in. Sorry. We went over 10 minutes. Um, like subscribe, comment down in the video down below, uh, video suggestions. We're going to be putting up, uh, polls on the YouTube channel. So you guys can suggest, uh, topics. You can be picked from topics that we're going to suggest, and we will be shooting the videos on that content. Uh, please make sure you answer those polls. Um, and we will see you guys in the next one.